Hello, and thank you for joining our session on Microsoft Graph APIs for Teams DLP. My name is Hamad Zarjoub. I'm a Director of Product Marketing for Compliance Ecosystem, and with me today is Nick Kramer, who is Principal Program Manager on Microsoft Teams. Today, we're going to talk about Microsoft Graph APIs for Teams DLP and how we can use them in your data loss prevention related and potentially other scenarios. Let's start with our vision and approach to compliance ecosystem. It's an exciting journey for us, and I'm glad to share it with you all. Our customers want and need our compliance system to be extensible. That's why we based our approach to building compliance ecosystem on five key pillars. These pillars enable you to adapt Microsoft compliance solutions to meet your unique needs, extend to non-Microsoft data, integrate with third-party systems to create seamless workflows, accelerate deployment and management at scale, and last but not the least, support your existing investments in third-party security and compliance offerings. Today, we are very excited to announce our three key investment areas. To enable our customers to reason over their entire data landscape, including Microsoft and non-Microsoft systems, we are extending our connector platform and enabling ready-to-use partner-built connectors. To enable system-level integrations, we're doubling down on our investments in APIs. We have exciting news on new graph APIs, as well as several enhancements in Microsoft Information Protection SDK. To meet unique needs of our customers, we're also investing in built-in customizations, such as Power Automate templates. Let's switch gears and talk about APIs. One of the key asks from our customers and partners is for APIs that enable integration for our compliance solutions with their existing applications and services. And to unlock this potential, we're announcing three new Microsoft Graph APIs. At the very high level, Graph API for Teams DLP enables third-party applications to leverage data loss prevention capabilities for Microsoft Teams. This is now generally available for developers, and we will be focusing on this today. Graph APIs for Teams Export enables third-party applications to provide enterprise information archival for Microsoft Teams. This is in public preview for developers. Graph API for eDiscovery enables workflow automation and third-party application integration scenarios. This is also in public preview for developers. And of course, we are continuing to invest in our existing capabilities, such as Microsoft Information Protection SDK, which has added a number of new capabilities to hit the version 1.7 milestone. Office 365 Management APIs also continue to add new actions and events that can be used in a variety of ways. Data loss prevention or DLP capabilities are widely used in Microsoft Teams, particularly as organizations have shifted to remote work. Earlier this year, we announced the public preview of Change Notification API for Messages in Teams. This API enables developers to build apps that can listen to Microsoft Teams message in real time to enable DLP scenario implementations. That's true for both customers and ISVs. Additionally, patch APIs allow applying DLP actions to Teams messages. Together, these two APIs form the Microsoft Graph API for Teams DLP, and today we are excited to announce the general availability of these APIs. During public preview, these APIs were available broadly. After GA, these APIs will become part of our E5 value to our customers, including but not limited to Microsoft 365 E5 and Office 365 E5. And with that, I would like to pass it to Nick Kramer to show us what's happening under the hoods and how to use change notification and patch APIs in real world applications. Nick, please take it away. Thanks, Ahmad. I'm really excited to be announcing the general availability of these APIs. We've been working on them for quite some time, so it's really exciting to see them get out there. So let's talk about the steps you'll need to take to use these APIs to create a data loss prevention application. First step is create your subscription. To do that, you'll need to do a few things. First, you'll need to create a certificate to use with encryption. You'll need to respond to a ping. Graph will call you back and basically say, are you ready? There's a bunch of messages about to come your way. And third step there is responding and renewing your subscription every hour. Uh, we don't wanna keep sending you stuff if you aren't ready to receive more material. Second big step is you need to actually receive those change notifications and process them. Once you get the description, then we start sending you the notifications. You need to do something with them. So as part of that, you'll need to validate the certificate of those notifications to make sure that callback actually came from where you think it did, prove it really came from graph. You'll need to then decrypt the payload. The message comes encrypted. You'll need to unencrypt it so you can make sense of it. 
Finally, once you've run your data loss prevention logic over the messages, you can decide which messages you don't like and then patch those messages. Patch is how you can then hide those messages from other users. So the original poster can still see the message and get feedback on what was wrong with it, and other callers and other users don't see the message. I'll also point out that while we built these APIs for data loss prevention, that's not the only thing you can build with them. Gaggle, for instance, has built a student safety app that is uh, deployed today and helping keep students safe for online learning. To create a subscription, you post to slash subscriptions, or you use the SDK to do the post slash subscriptions equivalent. When you do that subscription, there's a few parameters you'll specify. First, what is the resource that you want to listen to? In this example, I used slash teams ID, channels ID, messages. Listen to the messages in one particular channel. You'll also want to specify what kind of changes you're interested in hearing about. Here, create, updated, and deleted, but you can listen to only one of those three if you're so inclined. You'll need to specify the notification URL, that is basically where do you want to call me back when those things happen. For Teams messages, you'll want to include the resource data, which will actually give you the message. When you include resource data, you also need to provide an encryption certificate and an encryption certificate ID, which is used to encrypt the content so that there's no security problems. When you create a subscription, you need to provide an expiration date time, which is how long is the subscription valid for. It should be no more than one hour when doing Teams messages. If you're using the beta endpoint rather than v1, you can also specify a lifecycle notification URL, which basically gives you a reminder whenever that subscription is about to expire. And whether v1 or beta, there's also the client state, which can mean really whatever you want it to mean. When you create a subscription, there's a few different kinds of resources you can be notified about. You can do slash teams slash get all messages, which is all messages in all teams, you can do slash chats slash get all messages, which is all chat messages in all one-on-one -on -one and group chats, so not channel messages, group, but one-on-one -on -one and group chat messages. And so typically a DLP application will listen to those first two there, slash team slash get all messages and slash chats slash get all messages. We also support slash teams ID, channels ID, slash messages for when you want to listen to exactly one channel and slash chat slash ID for when you want to listen to exactly one chat thread. Uh, and you can create multiple subscriptions here. So you'd create one subscription for slash team slash get all messages and one subscription for slash chat slash get all messages is a fairly typical combination. When you create a subscription, you can be notified about new or edited or deleted messages uh, or all of the above. You will be notified about root messages, you know, the first message in a reply chain. You'll be notified about subsequent messages in reply chain. You'll be notified about edits if you ask for edits. And you'll also be notified about reactions, uh, those thumbs up icons, thumbs up, frowny face, those sort of things. Those will come in as changes to the original message. And those message payloads are going to include, obviously, the message text and the message title, also the formatting. It'll also tell you the at mentions. There's a separate uh, field in the message body for the who's at mentioned and what are the aliases, all that. Any adaptive cards that are displayed in the message body are included in that message payload. Uh, the images are sent as links, so there'll be a separate call if you want to get the body of the image. Uh, and stickers are basically images. Uh, code snippets are, believe it or not, actually a strange kind of image, or they're stored, and I should say they're stored in the same places that images are stored in. So they're, again, a separate download to get the body of the code snippet, but all the information you need is there. Uh, the attachments, similarly, attachments are typically stored in SharePoint or OneDrive, and the message will include a link off to those attached files. And for one-on-one uh, -on -one and group chats, membership is also available. Uh, again, a separate uh, API call is needed to make to get the membership, and that is available to you. When you create that subscription, you'll need an RSA certificate. There is more than one way to do it. My favorite is to use Azure Key Vault, but there's certainly other ways to do it as well that don't involve Azure. When you create your certificate, 
It doesn't need to be fancy, it just needs to be a self-signed certificate, or a self-signed certificate is supported, I should say. Uh, the key needs to be RSA, because we're going to use it with RSA, and the key size needs between 248 and 496 bits. And then export the certificate into Base64 encoded X509 format. And make sure you only include the public key, because that's really the whole point of this exercise, is to do uh, public-private key encryption, where you give us the public key and you keep the private key private, and that's what makes it useful. <laughs> and so um, I encourage you to go to one links in this page to see more details about this. Uh, key Vault page has some good details. The docs has some good details. After you create your subscription with post slash subscriptions, you need to respond to a ping. Graph will call you back to make sure you're ready to receive stuff. Actually, it's really a security measure to make sure that you're not trying to use Graph to spam someone else. So we send this callback, post slash your callback URL, and we pass in a validation token. And you, the receiver, needs to reply with that validation token in the message body and do a 200 OK return code, just to prove that you are, in fact, prepared to respond to these uh, subscriptions. A Teams message subscription will uh, expire every hour, so you'll need to renew them every, recommend every 55 minutes or so. As part of that, the only thing you absolutely need to patch when you do that is the expiration date time, but you can also use this opportunity to edit any other fields as you see fit. You can also, if you so desire, uh, change the certificate here. Once you have your subscription set up, when a new message comes in, you'll get a callback. Each message gives you one callback, and it'll be sent to the callback URL you provided. It'll have a bunch of different fields in here, but the key thing here is that unlike almost any other notification you've worked with in Graph, these notifications will actually have a payload. They'll tell you what changed. Most notifications in Graph, they tell you something changed. I'm not going to tell you what. Why don't you make an additional API call to figure out what changed? We thought that was wasteful, especially for a high volume situation like a DLP app. So we provide the message body in the initial callback. And it's an encrypted form in that data field. And so this is the sort of content you'll get back once you decrypt it. So these notifications have additional data that you don't see in other graph notifications, and so they have additional security mechanisms as well. The first one we've already talked about, the message is encrypted. We'll talk more about how to decrypt it in a minute, but it's important to know that it is there to protect that content from unauthorized users. Second point is these notifications have validation tokens, letting you know that this callback is in fact from Graph and not a callback from some attacker who happens to know your URL for your callback. Third point is there's a periodic authorization challenge in the form of those hourly renewals. By renewing those every hour, we are ensured that your access is fairly recent and you still have access to that data. Fourth point is that to access the webhook APIs for change notifications, you need to go through the protected API process and register your app with Microsoft. And uh, if you're doing this across multiple tenants, get this reviewed to make sure that you comply with the appropriate privacy and terms of use policies. Let's walk through some of those in more detail. So to validate the token, Graph will give you that token as part of the message payload and you need to use uh, JWT logic to verify that token is in fact from the correct publisher. And so here's a C-sharp example of this. This will vary depending upon, you know, if you use a different language, same concept apply, but you won't use the JWT security token handler library because you'll have a different SDK for that particular language. But basically, you're verifying the, the issuer, the audience, the uh, signing key, want to make sure the lifetime is at least not in the past, those sort of things. The next step is decryption. It's a two-part decryption. RSA is great. Uh, you know, Asymmetric encryption is great because it is convenient to work with. You don't need to give the same code and the same uh, encryption token to everyone. But the problem with RSA Descript is it's slow. So what we do is we decrypt just a little bit of data. We, we decrypt a uh, data key using RSA, and then we pass that data key onto a faster symmetric algorithm like AES. 
So here we use asymmetric private key dot decrypt to take that data key and turn it into a key we can then use with AES. Once we have that data key, we then apply that to the data signature and the data to make sure that this message has not been tampered with. Here we use HMAC SHA-256 to compute the hash for that data and compare it with the signature. Finally, we use AES to decrypt the payload. Here in C-sharp, we use AES Crypto Service Provider with the necessary modes. Basically, you pass in a big byte array and you get back a nice uh, memory stream that you convert into a byte array and then you have nice decrypted bytes you can do something with. Uh, details will vary from language to language, but ultimately it's all AES. AES is nice and standardized. Now that you have the payload decrypted, you run your DLP logic on the message and you see which ones you like and which ones you don't like. When you find a message you don't like, you can use the patch API to hide it and flag it as a policy violation. So we patch the policy violation property on that particular message. We specify a DLP action. Here we're going to block access to this particular message. Another option is to simply notify the user that they violated policy but still allow people to read the message. We specify verdict details. Um, users can have some options about uh, whether they can override the DLP policy. In this case, we're saying allow false positive override. The user can flag it and say, no, DLP engine, you screwed up. You flagged something you shouldn't have flagged. I override you. That was a false positive. Another option there is simply not allowed, which means the DLP engine is always right. We also support allow with justification, which means the user is allowed to type in an explanation for why that's allowed. And we also support the value allow without justification, where the user is allowed to decide to do it anyway without needing to give a reason. When you flag a policy violation, we recommend you provide a policy tip that tells the user why it was a policy violation. So general text is what we display to the user. Compliance URL will take you to a URL that describes the policy and what was violated here. And then match conditions is a, a machine generated field or machine readable field for why the policy was violated. And this is application specific, whatever you want it to mean. So let's recap what we learned. First step to using these APIs for DLP is to create a subscription to slash team slash get all messages and to slash chats slash get all messages. As part of creating that subscription, you'll need to create a certificate. You'll need to respond to a ping from the graph service to make sure that you're ready to receive these notifications. And you'll need to renew your subscription every hour. Once you receive those change notifications, you'll need to validate the certificate and you'll need to decrypt the payload. Finally, when you find messages that violate policy, you patch their policy violation field. So now that you know how to build data loss prevention apps, get started today. The APIs are generally available. They're on the V1 endpoint for Graph and uh, we encourage you to go build them. We also encourage you to tune into some of our other sessions, handy link here, and view some of our latest announcements. Thank you very much, and we look forward to seeing what you build.